It's the 23rd of March, 2013. And at St. Michael Church in Brookville, Indiana, people are gathering to honor the memory of eight individuals who lost their lives here in Brookville 100 years ago. Remember your servants, John Fries, Adelina Fries, John. Eight members of a single family, the Fries Cywert family, were swept to their deaths in the middle of the night when an avalanche of water from the rain swollen Whitewater River rose up, crashed down, and took them as they slept. Paul Fries. These eight family members were victims of what has come to be known as the Great Flood of 1913. All the sins of the past, all the bad things that we've done to the landscape, levees, draining this, that, cutting the trees down, came back and haunted us March 1913. The 1913 flood was the most widespread natural disaster that the United States ever suffered. And that includes Hurricane Katrina and Rita in 2005 and Hurricane Sandy of 2012. It afflicted 15 states, killed more than 1,000 people, did in 2013 dollars more than $115 billion worth of damage. They weren't kidding when they said every river turned against us. When every river turned against us, lessons from the great 1913 flood is made possible through the generous support of the Federal Emergency Management Agency Hazard Mitigation Grant Program and the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. Now here is the hazardous weather outlook for central Indiana for today and tonight, mostly cloudy with... Today you're at the National Weather Service here at Indianapolis. We're a field office. We issue the uh, daily forecast and when weather gets active, we put out the severe weather warnings. Tuesday, mostly cloudy with a 30% chance of rain. The weathermen in 1913 in Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, and Terre Haute would have been monitoring their barometric pressure. They would have noticed that it's starting to fall, and depending on how fast it was falling, to give them an indication and also the readings of how bad the storm was going to be. If you were going to turn an entire watershed, streams, creeks, rivers into a weapon of mass destruction that could wipe out cities, states, regions of the country, perhaps even half the nation. How would you do it? Well, you'd want to start with rain. Lots of rain. Day after day and night after night of torrential, unrelenting downpour. Rain like no one had ever witnessed before. And you'd want the ground to be totally saturated when the torrential downpour begins. So as little rain as possible will soak into the ground. And as much rain as possible will run off the ground, across the ground, hell-bent for the creeks and the streams and the rivers. And you'd have as many people as possible unwisely living in low-lying areas where there are no natural defenses, nothing between you and the rapidly rising water. These are places where houses should have never been built in the first place, and where it's easy for everything and everyone to be swept away without a trace. As you saw 100 years ago with that poor family from Brookville, eight family members swept away in their sleep. They never had a chance. And you'd have as few people as possible, maybe no one, be familiar with the river's eccentric behavior over the past 25, 50, 100 years. So no one really knows what to expect when the monsoon-like rains begin to fall and keep falling. No one has a clue as to what the potential danger might be. And so, no one is prepared with a plan to prevent it. And the dams and bridges and levees that everybody thinks are so safe and substantial 
would do what they were constructed to do and hold back the flooding river for a while. But the river is backing up behind them. It's exerting incredible pressure. And eventually the dam or the bridge or the levee gives way and the massive wall of water behind it comes crashing down on the population. And that's when you'd start seeing bodies. Men, women, children. One here, one there. There would seem to be no end to the bodies. And oh yes, a day or two before the rains began, you'd have hurricane force winds and tornadoes come through and take down telegraph and telephone lines, crippling communications so that the weather service couldn't receive word of what was brewing further to the west and few warnings could be sent or received and thus people would not know what is bearing down on them. No kind of rescue plan can be coordinated and cries for help to the outside world would go unheard. And then to top it all off, when people were at their most desperate, you'd have the temperature plunge, and you'd have it start to snow and ice up. Not just a few flurries here and there, but bitter, blinding, freezing sleet. So if the drowning didn't get you, you might still just freeze to death. And that's what it was like during the 1913 flood. All these things conspired together to create what was called an epidemic of disasters. The flood was a weapon of mass destruction. The pain and suffering was beyond contemplation. And the body count was high. The 1913 flood is sometimes called the Great Easter Flood. The rains started on Easter Sunday, March 23rd. And in less than seven days, the entire state was left in total disarray. Literally, if you threw a dart at, the, at a map of Indiana, any place that dart landed would have had serious impacts. In Fort Wayne, the weather forecast for Easter Sunday, the 23rd of March, was fair and warmer. On Monday morning, March 24th, after constant rain Easter Sunday, the 23rd, Main Street in Fort Wayne was under four feet of water. When the railroad embankment protecting Jeffersonville from the flooding Ohio River began to crumble and give away, the nearly 1,000 prisoners locked up in the nearby Indiana Reformatory were released. One shift at a time, and for nearly a week, night and day, despite the weather, they worked to both raise and reinforce the embankment. Not one prisoner tried to escape, and the city of Jeffersonville was spared. In Matthews, Indiana, the Cumberland Covered Bridge, built in 1877, had to be dragged back into place by horses after it was swept from its moorings by the raging waters of the Missinewa River and deposited a quarter mile downstream. In Indianapolis, the collapse of the White River Levee at Morris Street sent a wall of water two stories high and a half mile wide into four square miles of the near west side, dealing a near fatal blow to much of the city's business and industry. You had the full force of the 1913 storm system and flood basically centered right over the industrial north. You had a rail system that was frozen Railroads, the U.S. mails, suddenly stopped dead. Dairy products were not delivered to New York City because they had to go through our area. Just like today, we're the crossroads of America. Bad things happen here, it's going to affect the nation. This was Carnegie's empire, uh, Rockefeller's empire. All these were hit by this disaster. Flood relief efforts like the General Committee for Flood Relief Sufferers in Indianapolis were primarily homegrown initiatives, but a national relief effort 
still then in its infancy, had begun to reach out on a wider scale. The Red Cross, it was the first time that they had had to manage a disaster over hundreds of square miles. And through that, they were able to respond to battle casualties in World War I. And World War I was what really put the Red Cross on the map as a major agency. Outside Peru, at the winter home of the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus, the circus people had just enough time to escape to higher ground before the two rivers surrounding them, the Wabash and the Mississinewa, erupted into a vicious, chaotic, double-fisted flash flood. The circus animals, trapped in their cages, were not as lucky as their trainers who got away. The terrified sounds of neighing horses and the roaring of lions and tigers grew louder and more frantic as the water crept higher and higher. Until one by one, the animals grew quiet as the water closed above their heads. Days later, when the waters receded, almost 500 animals had died. It was not only the, the people that died, but unfortunately, a lot of animals. Both um, horses used for transportation and also uh, livestock for farms. And sometimes the animal carcass would be there five, six weeks later with you know, the onset of hot spring and summer weather. And so you can imagine how they were putrefying and the public health hazard. On Monday, the 31st of March, a week and one day after the initial Easter Sunday rains began. Four horse-drawn hearses lined up on Main Street in Brookville to carry the remains of the Free Cywert family to a funeral mass at St. Michael Church, then on to their final resting place in St. Michael Cemetery. Well, I'd say this is one of the most haunting photographs. That photo was taken by Ben Winans, a longtime Brookville resident. He picked up photography in the late 19th century, and in, in the span of 14 years, he recorded about 3,000 scenes in Brookville. And in 1913, he took uh, 100 photographs of the flood. I think his photographs are a, an excellent documentation of that most tragic event in Brookville history. I really am grateful to photographers who took the trouble, like Winans did, to go out when perhaps they may have had other concerns and photograph events like the flood. This is a camera of the type that uh, Ben Winans and others of his time used. Back in 1913, um, if you wanted to take a picture, you didn't pull your phone out. How many people today would have the patience to drag out that tripod and that big view camera and those glass negatives and try to capture the scene the same way Ben Winans did? It's so exciting to stand in a spot and see the old photograph in my mind's eye and then see the new space as, as we're reusing it or as we've re reimagined it. The one thing that's striking about a lot of these photographs too is that they all look very bulky. They all look overweight. Well, I don't think they were. I think they were wearing all the clothes they owned and it was the only way that they could escape with anything in these winter conditions and so they were wearing several outfits, one on top of another because they literally had only the clothes on their back. One of the earliest questions that hit me when I first came across evidence of this flood in 2003 is how does something that enormous get forgotten? But I think the answer is actually quite a number of answers. There were several things that swept the flood off the front pages of the newspapers after about 10 days. One was the death of J.P. Morgan. Another was the, um, the hunger strike that was going on by Sylvia Pankhurst and other suffragettes. 
third one was the illness of the Pope, and the fourth one was the uh, fall of Adrianople, which was one of the first steps on the march on the way to World War I. And it seems that people, their memories are very short. At the Indiana Historical Society in Indianapolis, a new exhibit, 1913, A City Underwater, connects our nearly forgotten natural disaster of a hundred years ago with the lives we live today. Scott Morlock is with the United States Geological Survey. Looking at all these pictures of destruction, you know, knowing there were at least 600 deaths with the 1913 flood, and it does inspire me to go to work at the USGS because a big part of our mission is providing the data and information people need to keep safe from floods. Keep holding, one more shot. Okay, we're good. The USGS, after a major flood, goes out and collects uh, high water marks. Those high water marks help help us document our, our major floods and their use for future flood mitigation and planning. Now this, this unit is an acoustic Doppler current profiler. Uh, basically the acoustic Doppler current profiler sends out sound waves into the river. Uh, the sound waves bounce off the particles that are in the water and uh, they return a signal and we can calculate a total width of the stream, a total depth of the stream, a total uh, velocity of the stream, and that allows us to calculate what we call a discharge, which is in uh, cubic feet per second. And all that data we're collecting from the stream gauge network out in the field, we can make tools from that data so that people can use that data to really understand what's going on in rivers, streams, and lakes. And a great example of that kind of tool for flooding is the USGS Flood Inundation Mapper. And so each one of these triangles on the map is a USGS stream gauge and also a weather, National Weather Service flood forecast point. So if we zoom in on any of these points, like for example, White River at Nora, we can bring up a map of the river near the stream gauge, and then we're bringing up a control panel. And then once that control panel comes up, we can zoom in a little bit. We can see neighborhoods and houses. And by simply moving a scroll bar up, once we've zoomed in, we can show what the water level would be at many different gauge heights so that we could take the real-time data or the forecast data and see what the flooding is going to be right away. So this is a very state-of-the-art tool. And the USGS just did not come up with this on its own. For Indiana, the Indiana Silver Jackets, a multi-agency hazard mitigation group, helped make all this possible with resources and funding. And so tools like this are really being used by communities to, to make their communities safer and more resilient from flooding, like what's happening with Columbus, Indiana, and their great flood response plan that they've just rolled out. Thank you guys very much for coming out tonight. We're, uh, we're very excited about unveiling our comprehensive flood risk management plan and the two big components are really about response and evacuation, so we're very well prepared, and then also to explore mitigation or prevention efforts. What we tried to do with this plan was to look at all spectrum of aspects of flooding. When the event occurs, how do you detect the event? What is the response? What is a, a recovery? What is the mitigation? And what is a uh, uh, preparedness? Uh, two days from now is the fifth anniversary of our flood in 2008 that absolutely devastated our community. And we had almost a half a billion dollars in property damage. Two persons died in that event and uh, our hospital had to be evacuated and closed for five months. And so this plan is so crucial. We're looking at projects, policies. We're, uh, we're as prepared as any community can be. If there's anything that was learned from the 1913 flood, but has been forgotten in the meantime, it's that living in harmony with the river means you have to give it space. There are places you should not build houses or office buildings or anything else. In northeastern Indiana, in July of 2003, the St. Mary's River gave the people of Decatur 
an unmistakable sign of its need for a little more space. I wasn't around in 1913, so I, they said it's a, that was the record flood, but I think we broke the record in 2003. I'm Joe Longsworth, this is my lovely wife, Pam Longsworth, and we lost our house in the flood of 2003. Joe and Pam weren't the only ones. Their home, along with the homes of more than 60 of their neighbors, had been built on low ground, much too close to the river. And the river didn't seem to like it. It was like the river had enough, and it decided to teach him a lesson. The flood of 2003 forced Joe and Pam and their neighbors to evacuate. And when they returned, their houses weren't really houses anymore. They were waterlogged, foul-smelling, health and safety hazards, structurally unsound, and contaminated with mold. They could no longer be lived in, they couldn't be repaired, and suddenly the Longworths and their neighbors were homeless. My name is Fred Arish. I was mayor of Decatur during the year of the 03 flood. Mayor Fred, how are you? Oh my God. <laughs> Mayor Ish and the people of Decatur agreed that the best chance to make life better for the newly homeless men, women, and children, and for the river, was to tap into the power of FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, administered by the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. The object of the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program is to provide funding to acquire homes and allow the people to move on to someplace safer. The other objective of the program is to demolish the homes and leave the area's open green space to allow the river the room it needs when the waters get high. The Indiana Department of Homeland Security, they come up with that, hey, there's these grants out there. Um, the money's out here, but you've got to apply for this stuff. It's a competitive type grant where you've got to, you know, be apply against other communities that flooded. I think it probably took about six to eight months uh, of just working 12, 14 hour days trying to put things together and, and get that information to a point where we could package it as an application and get it sent off to FEMA. Then the waiting began. It took us about three and a half years, but we did get our money and everything. 62 homes bought, demolished, took down, took out of harm's way, and made it a green space. It's encouraging to know that we have created programs as a community, as a state, that allow us to correct maybe the errors of our ways when we've uh, gotten too close to where Mother Nature thinks we need to be. This is where my former house used to be. It got flooded out. And back behind me, it was all houses at one time. And they tore the houses down and filled this in. And now we're giving the river a lot of breathing room. This is uh, the house that we bought with our buyout money. It's really a nice house, I love it. And the nice thing is there's no river, no creeks, no water around here close that I have to worry about getting flooded again. I can sleep at night now when it rains, not worried about somebody out there going underwater. So it's comforting. Mm. Okay. All How right. <laughs> Maybe you better try it again. <laughs> <laughs> a question in a lot of people's minds about the 1913 flood is, can it happen again? The answer, yes. People have to have looked at the results of the flood of 1913, just as we do after any natural disaster now, and think, what should we do differently? Have we learned how to do what we can to mitigate the effects of severe storms? And I'm just wondering sometimes 
if we have learned our lesson. We've begun to, to listen, but I think we need to do it a little bit faster um, and, and understand that every sidewalk, every roof, every driveway that we put in makes the water get to the river faster. And as a result, it floods faster and deeper and much more devastating to communities. There is a lower limit to rainfall, zero. There's no upper limit to rainfall. And floods happen on an irregular basis. They're, they don't come every, okay, I had this bad flood here this year. They're telling me it's a 100-year flood. Therefore, I'm safe for another 100 years. That doesn't work. There are places in this state where I could take you that are very scary, where they are, they're, they are building houses in areas that should never have houses. In Rocky River in Ohio, um, there is some developer who got some waiver from the city fathers to build a dozen three-quarter million dollar per unit luxury apartments on the outside edge of the Rocky River, only six feet above the normal level of the river. I took a bunch of before pictures because I know there are going to be after pictures. If there would be one recommendation that I would make to residents that live either in a close proximity to a flood risk area that's identified by FEMA or within that area, the number one recommendation, and I know people don't like to spend the money, but purchase flood insurance. If you would, I would like to, to ask us to, to recognize a moment of silence for the folks who perished in the 1913 flood, for those they left behind, and for the community that has, has grown from this since. Back in Brookville, the memorial service for the Free Seiwert family is coming to an end on the south side of town where the river turned against them a hundred years ago. One last thing about the 1913 flood. There have always been floods. There always will be flood events. But the 1913 flood showed us that Mother Nature will have her way. We can try all kinds of things, levees, flood walls, but sooner or later, Mother Nature will have her way. turned against us. Lessons from the great 1913 flood is made possible through the generous support of the Federal Emergency Management Agency Hazard Mitigation Grant Program and the Indiana Department of Homeland Security.